بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So alhamdulillah we're back for our weekly uh, weekly class. Uh, let's see. So inshallah tonight we're going to talk about, as we mentioned, the journey of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu anhu uh, to Yemen. Um, briefly, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he was from the ulama of the Sahaba. Um, not just from the ulama of the Sahaba. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said regarding Mu'adh ibn Jabal that of course in his ummah there will be scholars, ulama. Right? On Yawmul Qiyamah, Mu'adh ibn Jabal will be the first one in the line of all the scholars of this Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's the level of his knowledge that he had. He was an expert in halal and haram. He was the expert in the laws of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the Sharia, the halal and the haram. So Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, he had that level, level of understanding. That's the amount of fiqh he had about the deen. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had chosen him to go to Yemen. And this has been mentioned in a hadith that's mutafaqun alayh, that means it's collected and agreed upon, agreed upon and collected in both Bukhari and Muslim from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. So, uh, but before getting into that actual hadith and deriving the benefits from that journey of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, we have to understand this point first. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have sent Abu Bakr, could have sent Umar, could have sent any of, any of the other sahaba. But he chose to send Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu because he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam felt that Mu'adh was ready to go give a da'wah to a whole country and he had that knowledge of the Sharia. He had the knowledge of halal and haram to go and give da'wah. This is very important we know of groups, like let's say, uh, of course there's no reason for us to beat around the bush, bush alhamdulillah, especially uh, in masajid like this, where we openly teach the, the sunnah. Like let's say groups like jama'atul tabligh, right? You see them in our generation, they've been there from the 50s and the 60s, from the late 50s, that group. Somebody uh, might be influenced by them, they come knocking on your doors, uh, they take you, and mashallah, people change, right? Alhamdulillah, people change. Somebody joins them today, they'll tell him to start speaking from tomorrow. That's not the way da'wah was done, right? You have to have knowledge before you go start teaching. You have to have a certain level of knowledge before you go start teaching, right? So that's the number one point from even before we even get into the hadith itself, we have to understand this point. Who exactly was Mu'adh radiallahu anhu? His level of knowledge. Just that description that on the day of judgment, he will be at the front, the very first alim in the line of the ulama of this entire ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That shows you right then and there that the level of knowledge Mu'adh had as compared to the other even more senior companions like Abu Bakr and Umar. It doesn't mean that Mu'adh knew more than Abu Bakr or Umar. But the point was, radiallahu anhumah, but the point was he was somebody, an expert. Because when you go give da'wah, right, somebody's going to ask you questions and you will have to know halal and haram. That's common sense, right? Uh, you give a khutbah, somebody might start asking you questions even before you run out of the masjid about something that you said in the khutbah that he didn't understand. If you don't have the knowledge to explain what you just said, <laughs> then that's a big trouble, right? So uh, this is from the basics of the Prophet Sallallahu way of sending delegates to different places. He would send the best choice, he would send the most knowledgeable person for that task and do it. Because the Prophet Sallallahu was the leader of the Muslims. Abu Bakr was his best friend for 40 years. He didn't send Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr did not get offended. Right? Hey, I'm your friend for 40 years. You married to my daughter. 
How come you didn't send me to Yemen? Nobody used to think this way among the Sahaba, right? The Amir made a choice, made a decision. We all play a role in developing Islam. They all understood that, right? They didn't get jealous of each other over petty little things, right? So anyways, just like a, a proper leader should, uh, uh, and of course he is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma narrates that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose Mu'adh to go to Yemen to take the message of Islam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke to Mu'adh. He didn't just say, okay, you go tell them, uh, Ahlul Yemen, about La ilaha illallah. No. إِنَّكَ تَأْتِي قَوْمًا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ you are going to go to a group of people who are from Ahlul Kitab. Yemen, the whole country, were either Christians or Jews at that time. So he made it clear to Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. Right now, we saw, we saw the pagans of Mecca. We now in, in Medina, right? There were some Yahud in Medina as well, and of course, Mushrikun as well. But you are going to be sent to Yemen. Everybody there is Ahlul Kitab. They're either Christians or they're Jews. So the leader gave him of, uh, uh, information. He has to know his surroundings. And this is something very important for all Muslims. Whether we do da'wah or we are just an average Abdullah, an average Fatima, we have to know our surroundings. Where do you live? Right? Where are you? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَمَا يَسْتَوِي الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرِ The blind is not equal to the one who can see. They're not equal. The one who is blind and the one who can see are not equal. These two people are different. So, as a Muslim, as a believing man or woman, your eyes have to be wide awake. If, let's say us, sitting here as men and the brothers who are watching, if we don't know what is happening in the life of our wife or children, we have no idea. I mean, what type of leader are you, right? If your wife, wife is sad or happy or upset or angry, or your children are suffering with something in school or something else in their life, and you have no idea, right? That wouldn't make you really a good of a leader, right? It would make you actually a failure in most cases. You have to know your home. Then, you have to know your community, you have to know your society, you have to know your nation. You have to be aware of where you live. Where is it? What, what is around me? Right? So we see this from the very first, the second point, that he told Mu'adh radiallahu anhu clearly where you are going and what will be your environment. You have to know exactly what is happening. Right? And this is where a lot of the Muslim ummah, either we go to extremes that we start rebelling in the streets or we are asleep in our homes and we don't know nothing, not even what goes on inside our own house. The two extremes. But the Muslim has to be balanced. We don't go rebel in the streets, nor do we sleep in our homes to the point that we have no idea what's happening. I need to know what's happening in my house. I need to know what's happening in my community. I need to know what's happening in my city. I need to know exactly where I live and what's happening around me. This is the only way a Muslim can protect him or herself. If you have no clue what is happening around you, then you will have no one to blame but yourself when you get destroyed with the destruction. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ said, you are going to be going to a people who are from Ahlul Kitab, meaning they are Nasara wal Yahud, they are Christians and Jews. فَدْعُهُمْ إِلَىٰ شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا اللَّهَ وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The very first thing that you are supposed to do when you go there, you call them to the shahada. You call them to لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ made it very clear that you call them and you وَحِدُ الله. You call them, call them to the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where our dalil comes from. Why? Those of us who inshallah ta'ala are calling to the way of the salaf, are calling, sticking to Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Hadith, that we start with Tawheed. This is what Allah revealed very first, 
The first phase in Mecca is all about Tawheed, Jannah and Jahannam. No rules and regulations. Every prophet and messenger, the very first thing that they told their people to or called their people to was La ilaha illallah. That's their first thing. So the exact same way. If you want to teach people Islam, you have to start with Tawheed. There's no ifs, buts, hows and whys, nothing. It has to be through Tawheed, nothing else. Sure, from generation to generation, from place to place, certain things are a little bit different. The tools you use is a little bit different. What works in a village in some Asian country will not work in America. But the message has to be the same. Right? Let's say, subhanAllah, many of my teachers, right? They never had Facebook. They never had a single lecture on YouTube, nothing. After the COVID crisis and all of that, I actually sometimes joke with my shiuch, you guys are late. <laughs> Social media started 10 years ago, right? Like, uh, subhanAllah, many of the ulama, they used to tell us that Social media is completely haram. Don't even bother opening a Facebook account. Don't open Twitter. Don't open anything. Don't go there, right? Those same shuyukh now are using YouTube, are using Facebook, because the times have changed. Is using social media halal or haram? There's nothing in the Sharia talking about social media. It doesn't exist. The Quran and the Sunnah doesn't say anything. But how you use it can be halal and haram, right? Now, if a'udhu billah, somebody is using social media to watch bad things, he's doing haram. Somebody is using social media to learn Islamic things, listen to lectures, pass out information that he has learned or she has learned, not just blindly copying and pasting, but actually sharing knowledge. That's a good thing. Sometimes you want to keep in touch with your relatives who are in a different country that you can't otherwise keep in touch with on a daily basis. That's a good thing. You're keeping the ties of kinship. These few things, couple of things, literally, right? This is halal, this is from Islam. You're using it this way, go ahead, right? Any other thing, don't, don't, don't get into it. It's, gonna, it's just the, you know, shaitan is going to open the door to many other things or thousands of other doors are going to open to sin. You're using it like this, no problem, right? So certain platforms, they still say don't use it, right? But this is what I mean. With every generation, certain tools, certain things come out that we use, but the message is Tawheed. We'll use YouTube to pass the message of Tawheed. We'll use Facebook, we'll use Twitter to still focus on Tawheed first. The message isn't changing, but the medium is changing based on what generation or where we are, right? So, the, but the point is the da'wah always starts with Tawheed. This is the Sunnah of Allah. This is the sunnah of all the anbiya wa rusul. This was the way of the sahaba and this was the way and still is the way of all the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They never started with anything else. Never. Any place you go to, you always start with Tawheed. So he told Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, Fad'uhum. You call them to ila shahadati an la ilaha illallah. To the shahada that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. وَأَنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ And that I am the messenger of Allah. Right? The shahadatain. The importance of tawheed and the importance of testifying that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the final prophet and messenger. And you have to obey his sunnah. You don't have a choice. You have to follow. You have to worship Allah the way the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa worshipped. Right? This has to be made very clear to the people. فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لذلك. If they obey you, the people of Yemen understand La ilaha illallah, they understand that I'm the messenger of Allah. If they obey you in that, فَعَلِمْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةٍ Once they understand La ilaha illallah, once they understand that I am the messenger of Allah, then you tell them that Allah has made five daily prayers every day and night, throughout the day and the night, oblig obligatory upon them. The salah. Right? This is something you, we have to focus on as parents. You have to focus on as parents. We have children, uh, our sons and daughters, many of your kids, they go to public school. 
even if they go to Islamic school or homeschool, whatever the case may be, we have children who mess around. Mess around meaning they cause trouble, right? Uh, inshallah, not actual messing around, which is, uh, you know, related to zina, right? Inshallah, may Allah protect them all. Uh, but uh, they mess up in life. They make mistakes. They make trouble, right? There are parents we know from this community and, and every community, every community, including in Muslim countries, including the holiest of cities that exist. Do you think there are, I mean, every single young man and woman in the city of Mecca prays five times a day? No. If that was, I mean, we're, we're living in a dream world if we think that's the case. Even families who live in Mecca, they are dealing with problems with their children not praying five times a day. Right? So there is no way you can run away from that. There are people in Muslim countries that they have issues with children who don't want to follow Islam. They want to follow the Bollywood movies or this or that, right? They want to do what the singers and dancers are doing, right? Look at so many Muslim nations go to these Muslim countries. You will find hairstyles that exist there among the Muslim youth that even the Muslim youth here don't have that type of hairstyle. But that's what they learn from the movies and the songs, right? So this is a problem worldwide. You cannot run from this. Now, do I go and tell my son, he doesn't pray, he doesn't know Allah, he doesn't even believe in Allah properly, I hate the haircut he has. Am I going to start with his haircut or am I going to first tell him who Allah is? You have to first tell him who Allah is. This is how da'wah works. Many times, uh, just the other day, a family came, they're having a, the parents are having a huge fight with their daughter because she doesn't wear hijab. Right, so they came and talked with me, both parents, and I said, brother or sister, does your daughter pray? They're like, no. Not praying is kufr. Not wearing hijab is a major sin. Not praying is kufr. You're not even a Muslim if you do not pray. First, bring her to Islam. Then we can talk about hijab. Right? So many parents don't even understand this. Their children might be atheist, complete atheist, but they're worried about the daughter's hijab and they're worried about the son's haircut. Your son and daughter is an atheist, straight up atheist. They don't even believe in the existence of Allah. They don't care about a hairstyle or she doesn't care about covering herself. You always have to start da'wah with la ilaha illallah. They have to understand who created them. They have to understand who that Lord is. Otherwise, they will never do anything. It's not because of me. Okay, I'm the father. I tell you, make sure you're... I, I can't give you Jannah. Allah will give you Jannah. So you better at least recognize who that Allah is. Right? So you have to start that way, even with your children. Then, if they accept that, if they understand that, then you teach them. فَعَلِمْهُمْ Then you teach them. Right? First is, فَدِعُهُمْ you give the da'wah, you call them to la ilaha illallah wa anni rasulullah. They understand this, fa'alimhum. Now comes the teaching. First is the calling. They understand, they accept, they believe. Now comes the teaching. And the very first thing you have to teach is salah. Because that is the symbol of tawheed. You make ruku' to Allah. You make sujood to Allah, your creator. So that is the symbol of tawheed. Many times people find... You know, relics, uh, I had uh, the, these young brothers and sisters uh, long ago, you know. Uh, all Saudi Arabia, the Saudi government, you know, they are uh, destroying the relics of Islam. They're build, build, you know, they turned uh, the house of Khadija radiallahu anha into a bathroom of a five-star hotel. This is how people talk, and this is all propaganda, by the way. Okay, let's suppose it was the house of Khadija radiallahu anha. Are we supposed to preserve that house and worship it? Is that Islam? No, that's Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism. Every religion that you can think of, they have relics. Islam doesn't have relics. We are not worshippers of relics. This could be the bathroom of the house of Zainab or the bathroom of the house of Khadija radiallahu anha. We don't care. Nowhere does it say in the Sharia that People's homes have to be preserved and you have to worship that house. Doesn't matter. 
things develop over time, right? Subhanallah, we might bury somebody in this hole today, 50 years down the road, another person is going to be buried in that same, same spot. That's, that's Islam, right? The symbol of Tawheed is Salah. These are the symbols, the Ibadat, the Quran, the acts, the Muslim doing Islamic things. Those are the symbols of Islam. Not relics, physical, oh, the, look what happens. Oh, this is the hair of Rasulullah. Every Ramadan, somewhere, I forgot which country, every Ramadan it's open, the hair of Rasulullah. Is there any way on earth to prove that that is the hair of the Prophet Turkey. Oh, Turkey, Turkey, yeah. Right? We have no proof whatsoever, but thousands of people are going, yeah, yeah it's the hair of the Prophet, it's preserved. Suppose it, I mean, <laughs> right? Where's the proof? So somebody was passing on one strand of hair from the time of the Sahaba, here, 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 here. No, it doesn't work that way, right? So we uh, focus on things that are not important and forget the things that are actually important. All right. So, فَعَلِمْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةٍ فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ If they obey you in that, if they obey the Salah being obligatory, then فَعَلِمْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَدَقَةٍ تُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ فَتُرَدُّ فِي فُقَرَائِهِمْ If they obey and practice Salah, the five daily prayers, then tell them, teach them, that Allah has also obligated upon them the zakat. And what is the zakat supposed to do? تُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ فَتُرَدُّ فِي فُقَرَائِهِمْ This is another fiqhi ruling, a sunnah ruling. You take the zakat from the rich, min aghniyaihim, from them, where you went, where did he go? To Yemen. You take the zakat from the rich among them, فَتُرَدُّ فِي فُقَرَائِهِمْ The Prophet ﷺ didn't say bring the money back to Medina. He said take the zakat from the rich among them in Yemen and give it to the poor among them in Yemen. There. This is one of those ahadith where we get the ruling that it is from the sunnah to distribute zakat in the place where you live. Every Muslim community is obligated to look after themselves. The wealthy in that Muslim community are obligated to look after the poor in that same Muslim community. This is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. If there is excess money, then you go and send it to other places that you know of that are in need. You have to take care of your own community first, right? Let's suppose if I am busy feeding my neighbors and my wife and children are starving, how does that make any sense? I have to feed my own house first by Allah's rahmah. Then I feed the neighborhood. So the same thing. Muslims, the Muslim community is one family. You have to get into that zone. You have to understand that that is from Islam. You love for your brother what you love for yourself. This is your community. This is your family. Right? If it harms somebody in the community, it harms your family. You have to think this way. If my relative, in my Muslim relative, my Muslim brother, Muslim sister in this community is poor, is qualified for zakat, I have to give my zakat to him or her. Right? This is how the sunnah works. Every Muslim community takes care of themselves. Once there is inshallah excess that everybody is taken care of, nobody else needs zakat here, or it's all done, go ahead, send, it, send the excess money elsewhere, no problem. فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ فَإِيَّاكَ وَكَرَائِمَ أَمْوَالِهِمْ If they accept this, so you have the tawheed, uh, then you have salah, then you have the issue of zakat and sadaqah. If they obey you in this, if they obey you, O Mu'ad, in this, then tell them to be, uh, that be aware when you take the wealth, فَإِيَّاكَ وَكَرَائِمَ أَمْوَالِهِمْ If they accept it, be aware not to take from the best of their wealth. Right? Be balanced. Don't take the absolute worst like sometimes it happens. There's a winter clothing drive. We want to give... Uh, blankets and jackets to poor people, poor Muslims. Then somebody brings in a ripped up jacket. 
right? That's not worth donating. No one's going to be able to use that, right? We're not saying you give your, if Allah has blessed you, your $500 uh, Versace, Versace's jacket, if anybody has it, right? Okay, that something is your really top-of-the-line jacket that you got, or, or those, uh, what's it called? Uh, I think another uh, big expensive brand is uh, some Canadian goose or something like that is the name, or Canada geese or something like that. Anyway, one jacket's like $1,000, right? So, uh, but anyway, somebody is blessed to that. I'm not saying go donate that. But something reasonable, something balanced that the poor can utilize, right? They can utilize properly. So he told Mu'adh, he instructed Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, don't just take from the absolute best from their uh, property, right? Be balanced. Because otherwise people will develop a hatred. They won't like giving that sadaqah, right? You just took the best thing I have, right? So they be balanced. This is also from the sunnah, that be balanced, make it easy on the people, don't do something that becomes too harsh on them, and then they start hating the religion, right? وَاتَّقِي دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٍ And that's the last sentence in this particular riwayah. As I said, this is a hadith mutafiqun alayh, but this specific riwayah was from Sahih Muslim. Uh, and he reminded Mu'adh, radiallahu anhu, be careful, be mindful of the dua that the mazloom makes. Those who are oppressed, those to whom injustice is being done, be very careful of their dua against you. Why? فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٍ There is no hijab, there is no veil between that person making dua and Allah. Right? So the mazloom, when the mazloom makes dua against the zalim, Allah will accept that dua, will accept it. So this is very, very dangerous. So many times we see Muslims, they could care less who they're doing zulm to, who they're slandering, who they're lying about. They don't care. But how do you, not, how do you know if that person that you are attacking unjustly, that you are slandering, that you are oppressing, how do you know that person is not making dua against you? How? If that person complains to Allah, he may not be or she may not be complaining to anybody from mankind, but he or she has absolute freedom to make complaint against you to Allah in their salah. And if they do that, there is no veil between that person's dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is that you are going to give da'wah, true. You're going to go to call them to Islam, true, but do not do injustice to them. A warning to Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, because he's a human being after all, right? You might get weak, at a moment of weakness, somebody's, maybe somebody's lashing out on you, somebody's not accepting your da'wah, somebody's throwing you out. Whatever the case, that should not make you be unjust to them, right? You stay within the means of Islam. And, and the world we live in today, subhanAllah, let's say a devil, a human devil comes and does something bad to you. He or she already knows that you are somebody who fears Allah. You're not going to do the same things that they do. <laughs> right? They know that. So they take advantage of it. But if you are wise, if you are smart, you can stay within the means of Islam and take your justice. Right? Don't be shy from taking your justice within the means of Islam. Don't stoop to their level and do the wrong that they do in, as a retaliation. No, you retaliate in the way within the folds of Islam, within the means of Islam. No problem, right? So anyway, we see in this hadith, in this journey that the Prophet ﷺ sent uh, Mu'adh to in Yemen, to Yemen, of course, teaches us the entire principle of da'wah. A to Z, how we're supposed to do it, regardless of who we do da'wah to, whether it be the kuffar, our non-Muslim relatives, or our own Muslim relatives, right? You have to start with the importance of tawheed, right? It doesn't matter that this person might be a Muslim of 40, 50 years old. Even when you find family problems, right? And this is, you know, alhamdulillah, we, I try my best to do that as well. Even when we do counseling between, for, between couples or family problems or this or that, 
we have to make sure that they understand. Because it might be, okay, the husband's complaining about, oh, you know, she's not giving me my rights. And she says, he's not giving me my rights. The parents might say, my children don't give me my rights. Or the children may say, my father and mother don't give us our rights. We understand. You're all complaining about each other's rights. But have you given Allah his right? Or are you falling short? Right? That, that has to be explained to every couple, every family. The only way you can solve your problems is through Tawheed. There's no other way. No other way. Nothing will ever fix our problems except through full submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never will any problem be solved. Right? There might be temporary fixes, but you'll see within a week or two weeks, the same issue comes up again. So you have to fix the problem, which is lack of Tawheed in your life. Right? Don't be egotistic. It's not about me or you, it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? People just keep going, me, 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 right? They're the worst people, and we all know that. People who just think of themselves, they're the worst people, because you can never work with them. They, all they care about is themselves. But if these people cared about Allah, they would never be selfish, right? Uh, let's say, let's give a simple example. Let's say this is a masjid, right? Uh, okay, we need uh, the carpet to be vacuumed, right? Now, if one brother comes and he says, you know what, I, I touched the vacuum cleaner first. I'm going to fight with you if you try to do this job for me. This is m me. I am the king of vacuuming. <laughs> and nobody besides me can do this. We have a problem here. It's not about you. It's about Allah's house. Right? What if you're sick? What if you are late? What if something is going on? Are we all supposed to sit here and wait? No. The king of vacuuming has to come first. Who cares if there's trash building up here for a month? We have to wait for him. It doesn't work that way. This is, I mean, madness. As long as Allah's house got cleaned, who cares by who? Alhamdulillah, because it's for Allah, right? This is the simplest example I could think of, right? Now, likewise, everything else in life. Who cares who is doing the job? Is it benefiting the Muslims? Yes. Is it helping Allah's cause? Absolutely. MashaAllah. Let me enjoy it too. Obviously, I'll enjoy it too. Anything that benefits the Muslims, I'm a Muslim too. <laughs> I'm going to benefit from it, right? But the selfish person does not see that. The one who understands Tawheed, he will understand this, right? You look at uh, today what's happening. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from this fitna. You know, I have, I'm not going to mention their names. We wanted to invite, this is back in the day, uh, you know, long ago. Uh, I was in Texas. Me and my friends, we wanted to invite this brother that we saw, mashallah, was quite popular with the youth and this and that. So uh, we wanted to invite him to speak at our masjid. The brother, may Allah forgive him literally asked how many people will be showing up to the program. What's it? Why does the number matter to you? No, he needs that big number. So we said, I don't know, 40, 50. He said, no. And then me and my friends were like, what the heck? SubhanAllah. What, he has to have like 200 people listening to him? Compare this with Sheikh Albani, an alim, a muhaddith, right? One of his students who was from Bangladesh told Sheikh Albani, you know, you go to so many places. There are so many Ahlul Hadith people in Bangladesh. If you come and give just for a lecture, you know, you are the muhaddith of our generation. The national stadium which holds 100,000 people, we can book the stadium, you can give the lecture there, 100,000 people will be there. So then Sheikh Albani asked this Bengali student of his, so you're telling me that 100,000 people, no, it's like, Sheikh, there's more, but the stadium can only fit 100,000. Just say yes, you'll see millions of people lining up. So he said, no, I'm not going to come. So the student actually thought maybe Sheikh Albani didn't like this. Okay, you need something bigger place or this or that? Okay, the national masjid or this? It's like, no, 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 doesn't matter. It's like, okay, how about the university? Doesn't matter. Then Sheikh Albani said, I will never go to Bangladesh. And the student said, why? You already told me that 100,000 people are going to come and listen to a lecture of mine. I'm not going. 
that's an alim. The moment he heard the number, he says, nope, I fear for myself. I'm not here to be famous. Right? That's the difference between an alim and some da'i looking for some fans. Right? You have to understand this. The man of tawheed, men of aqidah, women of aqidah, it's not about who can see me or who doesn't see me. You look at through the biography of somebody like Imam al nawawi Forget Sheikh al-Bani. Imam al nawawi Even the Shia <laughs> places will have Riyadh al-Salihin or Arba'in al nawawi Right? Doesn't matter what group they're from. Subhanallah. The books that he compiled, Allah has blessed him. He wasn't famous when he was alive. He became famous after his death. Like super famous, right? And he died young, like 45, 46 years old. Subhanallah, right? So the fame comes from Allah. You are supposed to chase Allah. Allah will give you the fame according to what He believes is best for you. Don't chase the fame. Don't chase the title, right? So th this is why the Prophet ﷺ also even said something related to this. We don't give leadership to people who keep asking for the leadership. That's not the way it works in Islam. If you are fit, the people will push you forward. That's the good leader. The people know, we, we live here, we know who's good for us, who's bad for us. The people will push you forward because they trust you. They already have dealt with you, they see you, they will push you forward. But don't stick your neck out, right? Don't stick your neck out. So the one who chases Allah, Allah will suffice him, Allah will protect him. The one who understands Tawheed, he'll know this. It's not about me. The world does not revolve around me. The world is moving because of Allah. Right? That person will understand this. So it starts from families, communities, uh, societies, uh, nations, everything. Right? Every aspect uh, of life, regardless of the people's uh, positions. So we understand this. Now, also... We, in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, going back to another lesson here. The Messenger ﷺ, in another narration, and this is in Bukhari, the narration in Bukhari, he told Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, Yassira wala tu'assira. Make things easy and don't make things difficult on the people. Wabashira wala tunaffira. Give the good news and don't just push people away. Right? Make things easy. Somebody says, let's give an example. He does not pray. She does not pray. If you start telling your son and daughter who does not pray, you know what, at duhr time, you have to pray uh, four rakat sunnah, then you have four fard, then you have two sunnah, and he's scratching his head there, I have to pray ten rakat? Right? That's what he's thinking. Focus on what is fard. You have to pray four raka'at. You start slow. Make things easy. Don't make it difficult. If you tell them at duhr you have to pray ten raka'at, I'm not going to spend 20, 30 minutes praying. I don't even pray for two minutes. Right? You have to understand how to teach and how to give that da'wah. So he told Mu'ad, yassira wala tu'assira. Make things easy within Islamic foes. People twist this hadith, oh, make things easy, music is halal, this is halal, that's halal, everything is halal. <laughs> that's, that's not what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about, right? Make things easy within the folds of Islam. Within things that are allowed, make it easy. Let them start slowly, right? Somebody, again, your kid just got into the habit, is still kind of shaky in five daily prayers. You, wake up at 3 a.m. with me and pray to Hajjud. Don't pressure him so much. Then he's going to push away from salah again. Let him practice the five daily prayers. Then he'll start the sunnah. Right? وَبَشِّرَ وَلَا تُنَفِّرَ Give them the good news. Don't push them away by making it so hard. Right? Another example in terms of women. Let's say she doesn't wear hijab. I'm not going to tell a sister, you know what, niqab is fard. I can't even cover my hair. You want me to cover my face and hands too? She's going to run away. Right? She's going to run away. This young girl is going to run away. You have to know how to educate, how to do the teaching within the folds of Islam. Right? 
If there are two opinions, two valid opinions, give that which is easy so the person can start practicing it. Don't give the most difficult one, right? Then uh, the Prophet ﷺ also said, uh, and that, so uh, make things easy, don't make it difficult, give the good news, don't push people away. Uh, and cooperate with each other and do not keep differing. He taught them, taught this to Mu'ad. You're going to pe people, learn how to cooperate with each other by keeping the religion intact, right? Many people, they think, well, you see, this person, uh, he doesn't like the aqidah of Tawheed. It hurts his feelings, so in order to cooperate, let me forget Tawheed and I'll cooperate with him. No, that's not what the, the very first thing is Tawheed, right? He already took care of that. Then as he's instructing him with other instructions, he's explaining to him that cooperate with the people. As long as they have said that they are upon Tawheed, they're striving on Tawheed, their aqidah is your aqidah, right? The right aqidah. People are going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. You have to have some type of rahmah for your brother, right? This is where some people become like the khawarij. The khawarij ideology, if they ever see somebody drinking alcohol, they immediately say, fulan is a kafir. They make start, start making takfir. No, he, he's a major sinner, but you can't make takfir on this person, right? A woman prays five times a day, but she doesn't wear hijab. She's a major sinner, but we don't say she's a kafira, right? Don't be like the khawarij. Oh, this guy made one mistake. He's deviant, <laughs> right? He's not on the sunnah. He's out. That's it. Gone. Take it easy, right? Is his aqidah... Uh, the aqidah of Islam, his understanding of the sifat of Allah, his understanding of tawheed, his understanding of the sunnah, his approach to the sunnah, is it all okay? Is he reading from the same books as we read from? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, we, I make mistakes, he makes mistakes, she makes mistakes. We can't excommunicate each other or throw people off the manhaj because of human errors. This is ridiculous, right? This is from shaitan, right? And then we see people, subhanAllah, uh, and I've seen this happen. Somebody will say, uh, a group of people from Sunnah will come, oh, the Imam in this masjid's not on the Sunnah. I'm not talking about this masjid, I'm just, you know. Uh, the Imam's not on the Sunnah, or maybe he's, he doesn't agree, agree with me with all 10 fiqh opinions that I know of. He agrees with nine. So because he missed that one, he's deviant, I'm out. Then that group of people actually end up in deviant masajid, where they don't have the right aqidah, they're preaching bid'ah, they're doing bid'ah, because shaitan took them away, right? You have to be balanced in your approach. So he taught Mu'adh, as long as people have that aqidah, you start with tawheed, make things easy, don't make it difficult, give the good, glad tidings, don't repel people away, right? You see somebody taking drugs in the street, you don't tell that young man or woman, that's it, you aren't going to be in Jahannam forever. This person will think, okay, there's no hope for me. So, you know, screw you and screw everybody else. I'm going to keep sm smoking the crack. He'll never change. But if you tell him that brother, sister, what you're taking, this drugs, it leads to Jahannam. But there is hope. You can give this up. And ar rahmanu rahim will forgive you. You have hope. He will still grant you Jannah if you give up this path. This person will now think, my Lord is a merciful Lord. My Lord wants to give me chances. But if you told this person, that's it, I've, I've, taken, I've seen you taking drugs, you are destined to the hellfire forever. Right? We don't have the right to do that. Somebody is alive, he or she has the chance to repent and enter Jannah. Somebody died as a kafir, we know that somebody died as a fasiq, we know the rulings, that's different. But somebody is alive. You have to give people chances, right? I remember when I first came here, people have personal problems with somebody. It's like, Shaykh, that guy has a haram job. Okay, I should talk to him first. You have a halal job? He's like, yeah, I'll talk to him more. That's my job as a da'i. The guy who has the haram job, I have to give him da'wah more than the guy who has halal job. Otherwise, why are we here? Just to talk to the people that already pray? It doesn't make any sense. I have to talk to the people who don't pray and tell them why they should be praying, right? 
That's what teaching Islam means. You have to spread the message. So the Prophet ﷺ instructed Mu'ad with these uh, other instructions so as to cooperate with the people, be nice with the people, be balanced with the people, not to become a tyrant and a dictator over the people or be too harsh with them, right? So you have to understand this. The sunnah is ease. The sunnah is that which is that which gives peace to the heart. Any way of sunnah, talking, sunnah, da'wah, whatever the case is, that will be a balanced da'wah. The moment we go to extreme in any one idea or any one aspect, we've shifted our attention away. So the Prophet ﷺ makes it very clear to uh, Mu'ad in this manner. Uh, also in another hadith in Bukhari from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, a different narration, uh, talking about a different situation, not in this journey of Mu'ad. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Inna dina yusrun walan yushad dina ahadun illa ghalabahu." The deen is very easy. Allah made this religion very easy for people to practice. And no one who goes to extreme, I mean anyone who goes to extreme, he'll be destroyed. There's, I mean, he's not going to be safe. If he becomes shadid, like really harsh, he will not be able to hold on to it. And I know brothers and sisters, their whole life used to revolve around refutation. When the internet first came, like, man, who made you the, like the uh, internet jihadi? Deviant, this site is deviant, this guy's deviant, 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 everybody's deviant. This is all they're doing, right? The whole day long, every website they're going to go to, every comment that they go to, they have to argue with somebody, right? They still do this on Facebook and Twitter. You don't like somebody's page, dislike, move on, right? No, I need to argue and argue, prove my point, this, that. These type of people eventually... Stop praying, stop, be, they leave. I've seen brothers who used to refute. Their business was about refutation. Now they don't even pray. No one will go to extremism except that they will be destroyed. This is the words of the Prophet ﷺ, right? You can't do this. Extremism never brings barakah. You have to have balance. Refutation is okay sometimes. Every single day should not be refutation, right? Sometimes we do have to refute. Sometimes we do have to criticize. Allah criticized mushrikun. Allah criticized munafiqun. Allah refuted munafiqun. We have to do that too. This is the sunnah of Allah. But every single ayah is not a refutation of the hypocrites. Some ayats are. So sometimes we refute. Other times we teach. You have to keep a balance. Right? And life cannot be just refutations. Uh, then we see um, another version of this hadith where... Uh, from Anas radiallahu anhu that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said ittaqu da'wat al-mazlumi wa in kana kafiran fa innahu laysa dunaha hijab be mindful of the dua of the oppressed even if the oppressed is a kafir many muslims they think it's haram for me to cheat my fellow muslims but it's okay for me to cheat the kuffar no cheating is cheating whether you do it for, with the Muslim or you get, do it against the Kafir, right? Look at the history of Indonesia, Malaysia, these places. The Arab businessmen came. They were so honest. Those people asked, like, we've never dealt, done business with people who are so honest. Why are you guys like this? And those Arabs of old, they said, this is Islam. And through that interaction with businessmen, Muslim businessmen, Indonesia, Malaysia, these places became Muslim. There was not a single battle that was fought in those lands. Right? Not a single battle. They dealt with Muslim businessmen. Right? So you have to be like that. Your actions as a Muslim, if you follow the Sharia of Allah, you will be the ambassador of Islam. You don't even have to teach anybody anything. Somebody asks you a simple question. It's like, hey, why are you so friendly? Why are you so nice? Why are you doing this? This is my religion. This is what I'm supposed to do as a Muslim. Allah, my God, the creator of everything, he obligated me to be this way. That opens the door. The person is going to start thinking. It's like, really? Who is this creator? Tell me more. And that's how you open the door to da'wah and, and, and talking to them about tawheed. So uh, the point is that you cannot oppress anybody, even if the person is a kafir. Even a kafir, sure, Let's say you're making, uh, some, uh, Allah forbid, somebody's oppressing a Christian. Most of the times he's calling, oh Jesus, oh Mary. 
right? Oh, sweet mother of God. This is what they're saying most of the times, right? <laughs> but sometimes they do say, oh God, how do you know when they say God, they're not being sincere and Allah is not accepting that dua? How do you know that? So the Prophet ﷺ warned us, do not oppress people even if they're kuffar. Because even they, if they forget the shirk and at one moment somehow sincerely calls on God, God may listen. Right? Then you'll be in trouble for oppressing people even if they be uh, kuffar. Also, uh, Mu'ad said uh, in, in another narration in the Musnad of Ahmed, another sentence was said by the Prophet ﷺ. To Mu'ad, إِيَّاكَ وَالتَّنَعُمَ Be aware of luxury, extravagance, right? فَإِنَّ عِبَادَ اللَّهِ لَيْسُ بِالْمُتَنَعِمِينَ Because indeed the true slaves of Allah are not extravagant, right? It's just not... Uh, from the adab of a true abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be extravagant. Right? This doesn't mean that if Allah has given you wealth, you live like a poor person. No, you should be happy with the ability that Allah has given and you enjoy yourself and your families with your families, but you don't be extravagant. Right? Like, let, what is extravagance? Let's say Allah has blessed you, you're a multimillionaire. Okay, you can afford one Ferrari, no problem. Who told you to buy five? That's extravagance, right? Or, okay, you know what? I have a Ferrari, a Lamborghini, and a Porsche. This is extravagance, right? What are you going to do? Drive all three at the same time, right? So th these type of things are extravagance. Buy yourself a Lamborghini, a Porsche, or a Ferrari if Allah has given you the means, right? No problem. But once you get into that zone of extravagance, like sometimes you see these rich people, you know, those lifestyles of the rich and famous or these uh, YouTube channels that they show. Somebody has like 20, 30 cars and cars, you're like, oh, I haven't even driven this in six months. That's extravagance. You have a car that you haven't even driven for the past six months and it's just sitting in your garage collecting dust, right? So th those type of things are extravagance. So the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ warned Mu'adh, be aware of extravagance. Or uh, you see, uh, you know, the televangelists, everybody needs that, uh, what is that called? G6 or G60 plane or something like that, right? <laughs> and they got uh, caught by uh, 60 Minutes. And that guy from Texas, uh, he looks very scary too. He's like, I'm doing Jesus' work. Jesus told me that I need to buy this expensive private jet and travel the world. <laughs> I was like, no, man, you're robbing people's money. One plane is $60 million. Jesus didn't tell you to go buy a plane for $60 million using your church goer's money. Well, <laughs> you know? so, so, so those are extravagance. This is craziness, right? And, and this goes also, as, I, as you hear me sometimes say, that sometimes we find people made dawah into an extravagant business, Right? Like you invite one speaker, one speech is $5,000. That's his rate. Just for one lecture. Like, that's crazy. It's like, brother, one lecture is $5,000? Who are you? You know, Abu Hanifa? <laughs> you know, <laughs> who are you? Like, you're, so uh, we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Don't turn dawah into an extravagant business for yourself. Uh, then, uh, we'll end with this, then eventually the Prophet ﷺ asked Mu'ad, or told Mu'ad, it was a, this is also in the version in the Musnad of Ahmed, uh, sorry, this is the version in At-Tirmidhi, this is the narration in At-Tirmidhi, uh, because this incident was recorded in various books of hadith, with slight variances in wordings. So, uh, this one is from Harith ibn Amir radiallahu anhu, he said, uh, when some of the people that were with Mu'ad, and uh, they said to the Messenger Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam that, you know, sent, he's going to Yemen, we heard, so teach him some more, his judgments, how is he going to judge? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Mu'ad, كَيْفَ تَقْضِي How are you going to judge the people? You're going to go to Yemen, right? Inshallah they become Muslim, and they did, right? Yemen became a Muslim country. 
through that da'wah. كَيْفَ تَقْضِي How are you going to make the judgment on people? Because you are their religious teacher, people will come to you and ask you to be the qadi, the judge. How are you going to judge between people? Mu'adh replied to the Prophet "Aqdi bima fi kitabillah." I'm going to judge by what is found in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anybody comes with me in questions and judgments and problems, disputes, whatever the case, I will make the judgment on them based on the Qur'an, the kitab of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ then asked Mu'ad, فَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ What if the issue that they come to you about is not in the Qur'an? There's no ayah in the Qur'an giving the solution to that. So Mu'ad then said, فَبِسُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. Then I'm going to go to your sunnah. Right? Now remember, back then, the hadith are not yet recorded. So whatever he knows in his mind, he has memorized. Right? Or he can ask some other companion. Now we have the hadith books compiled. Right? You go to sahihbukhari.com or even easier, sunnah.com. The books are there. Right? But still, I would like to, uh, whoever's watching and here, even when you go to sunnah.com, there are some mistakes in translations. So just be careful. Don't just rely one. That's again. This is proof. This is from Allah. Just I'm gonna go to Sunnah.com and Bukhari's there, Muslims there, Abu Dawud's there, Muatta of Imam Malik's there, the Musnad of Ahmed is there. All these books are there already uploaded in Arabic and English. Uh, and you blindly just take it. No, there are still mistakes in translation, and they have an option. If you find a mistake, you can actually tell them, and they do. Mashallah, uh, the website builders they correct it right away. If you catch it, because human, we are human beings, we're going to make errors, right? We are always checking each other, right? So you have to keep that research going. Uh, also, sometimes they have uh, the, uh, the harakat, are, are, uh, there's mistakes in the harakat that they posted too. Uh, you know, I, I forgot what you guys say in Bengali and Urdu, but the fatha kasra damma, uh, there's some mistakes in the words uh, sometimes, yeah. What is it? Jeb? Oh, Jeb Jabbar Pesh. I'll probably forget it by the time I go home. <laughs> so, yeah. Fatha Dhamma Kasra. Let's stick to that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so there, you know, but the point is it's easy, right? Things are easy. So, you go research and you judge based on the Sunnah. Then the Prophet said, فَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. Now, what if it's an issue? That is also not available in the sunnah of Allah's Messenger There's no hadith about it. What are you going to do then? Mu'ad then replied, Ajtahidu ra'i. I will make ijtihad based on my opinion as much as I know. Right? So he's the teacher, he's allowed to make ijtihad based on whatever he knows from his own opinion. That he can't find it in the Qur'an, he can't find it in the sunnah. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, so this is the step. Anybody comes to you for judgment, business judgment, marriage judgment, family judgment, community judgment, this is how we have to be. Go to the book of Allah. Is this specific situation there? Alhamdulillah. If not, go to the ahadith. Is it there? Alhamdulillah. If it's not there, then ijtihad, the personal opinion of that uh, the, the teacher, the religious teacher, the scholar, the student of knowledge, whatever your situation is. Different people are in different situations, circumstances. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, after hearing this from Mu'adh, Alhamdulillahi alladhi waffaqa rasoola rasoolillahi sallallahu alayhi wa All praise be to Allah, who has made waffaqa, given waffaqa coming from tawfiq. All praise be to Allah, the one who has given success to the messenger of the messenger of Allah. Because he is going on behalf of Rasulullah as a messenger to Yemen, right? So he said, all praise be to Allah for the messenger of the messenger of Allah being guided and successful. So this is the answer that he was looking for, that this you have understood. This is the way to, to go about things. So we see here in conclusion, before we go to some questions... Um, we see here that the Prophet ﷺ being the leader that he was, right? He knew everything. 
He knows about the situation. Of course, Allah inspired him. He gave, he gave him that knowledge. He made sure that his, the person he's assigning the task to, he taught him very well, educated him about the environment, educated him about what to expect at his job, and how to go about his job. This is what you have to do. Right? Now, if I select somebody, let's again use the example of the masjid since we're here. I select somebody to run the masjid and he has zero training and no one has even taught him. What's his fault if he makes mistakes? Did anybody teach this person when he took this task? No. Right? So this is common sense. Am I going to bring a bicycle to my son and say, here son, ride the bike. And if you fall off, you'll get hurt and I'll give you a smack too. No, I have to teach him how to ride the bike. Right? So this is how it works in anything in life, from simple things as learning a bicycle to all the way at your job. When you go get a job, the brothers, uh, engineers, whoever they may be, you go interview for your job, your manager, your boss tells you exactly at the job interview what they expect from you, what your job actually is. If it's for you, okay, if it's, oh no, I can't do this, right? Okay, the job's not for you. This is how it has to be, right? So the Prophet ﷺ taught all of this. All of these life experiences are gained from this one hadith of Mu'ad ibn Jabal. Religious aspects, definitely, how to give da'wah. And even dunya aspects, how to be a leader, how to be successful in your job, how to be aware of your surroundings. All of this the Prophet ﷺ explained to Mu'ad. Then he shipped him off with a, on a camel ride, right? Here, go to Yemen now. So you have to prepare the person properly. So let's uh, go to uh, the questions.